Hello everyone. What we were about to see and hear is shocking on many levels. Besides the enormous human tragedy of three victims lost to murder, two of them children ages 8 and 10, there is also the fact that this story has been kept largely unknown by Jehovah's Witness leaders for almost 30 years. These murdered, murders occurred in 1985, but have just now been exposed to public scrutiny. What we see is not the fruitage of a church or a religion, but the practices of a destructive cult, and its fruitage is complete devastation wrought in the lives of untold numbers of innocent people. The timeline and names contained in this tragic tale are somewhat difficult to follow. The people so devastatingly affected are James Kostelnik and his wife Kim, who were divorced in 1980 after having two children named Lindsay and Yuri. In 1981, Kim met a professing Jehovah's Witness and petty thief named Jeffrey Anderson. They married in 1981. The abuse begins even before their wedding and escalates to include the sexual abuse of Kim's daughter, Lindsay, by Mr. Anderson. In spite of the fact that the elders knew of Jeff Anderson's abusive nature and aggressive actions towards his wife and stepchildren, they did little other than urge her to reconcile with her abusive husband, exposing her and her children to further harm. The senseless tragedy of the murder of these three innocent victims occurred on August 29, 1985. It is in a small effort to honor the memories of these three innocent victims that this material is presented in its entirety. Secondarily, it is my hope that all who view this will ponder the admonition herein contained. It is a dangerous thing to surrender your thinking to people who claim to speak for God. This presentation contains dramatic recreations of violent events, which younger viewers may find disturbing. This long withheld story of senseless tragedy, which occurred in British Columbia, Canada, is now presented without interruption. Burnaby, Canada is a small enclave in the heart of the Pacific Northwest. For generations, it's been home to a tight-knit community of Jehovah's Witness families, including the family Kim Anderson grows up in. They call themselves the happiest people on earth. They would share stories about how people were often drawn to them because of how happy they were. Witnesses originated in 19th century America. They are a Christian denomination, distinguished by belief in a God they call Jehovah and an exceptionally strict moral code. By April 1972, Kim has grown into a devout high school student. Have you heard the good news? She spends up to 100 hours a week working as a full-time missionary. Kim felt that it was important to try to save people. That meant going door to door and converting them. Like her fellow witnesses, Kim sees herself as separate from the secular world. The witnesses are admonished to keep their association with outsiders, non-witnesses, to a minimum. And so Kim did not have a lot of friends. She wasn't popular. Kim it was the desire on her part to find a strong male witness leader. She thought Jim would fit that bill. Jim is Jim Kostelnik, a third generation Jehovah's Witness. Kim meets him at a party on a spring evening in 1972. She's 18. Jim is 25. Thanks, Jim. Jim. And Kim. <laughs> After a year of dating, their plan to marry is approved by the local church elders. The wedding day at Kingdom Hall is magical. 
the witnesses really lavish and enjoy those weddings because the other celebrations that outsiders enjoy, like Christmas, we don't have that. So weddings are very important. The young married couple's life revolves around their work for the church and their plans to start a family. Within three years, Kim gives birth to a boy named Yuri and a girl, Lindsay. Their universe begins and ends with the church. We were going to three meetings a week. I was putting in 100 hours a month in the door-to-door -door ministry. By 1974, the couple's evangelism is growing more fervent. The end of days is upon us. Church leaders claim Jehovah has told them the exact year the world will finally end, 1975. Armageddon is coming soon. There would be no more grief, no more illness, no more death. Everything would be wonderful and sunny. Jim and Kim wait eagerly for the new year to arrive. But 1975 passes without an apocalypse. The world was to end, and it didn't happen. It's a public relations nightmare for the church. He has... There were all these different predictions that they made when the end was coming. It was coming soon in the 1800s. It came soon in 1914. It came soon in 1975. This is what the witnesses are selling, a promise they cannot keep. If you have questions, just ask them. If they were wrong about when the world will end, what makes you think they're right about anything else? Profoundly shaken, Jim openly expresses some of the doubts he has about the church. I started asking questions. I talked to Kim about it. She said, go to the elders, talk to them. And the elders had no answer, really, other than keep going to the meetings, keep going door to door in the ministry. It made me quite angry. Kim is devastated by Jim's loss of faith. Hers is as strong as ever. She knows Jim's seemingly subversive behavior could have dangerous consequences for her marriage and her own standing in the church. People who question the validity of the Jehovah's Witness beliefs, they can be sanctioned and even disfellowshipped or excommunicated from the organization. If your family members are all Jehovah's Witnesses, you'll lose your family. But church leaders claim the apocalypse is still coming, and the congregants themselves are somehow to blame for the delay. The Lord has found us one. At the assemblies, the witness speakers were saying, it's your fault. It's like they were blaming the rank and file, and that really turned me off. Now, Jim openly threatens to leave the church, a radical step that could destroy his family's good standing in the community. For Kim, her husband's open doubts create a different kind of apocalypse. Kim asks her church elders to hold a meeting, known as a judicial committee, so they can lead her in the right path. They instruct her that it's better to be a single mother than to raise children with a non-believer. Kim never questioned the authority of the witnesses. The elders are to be feared because of the harsh judgmental responses to wrongdoing. After six years of marriage to Jim Kostelnik, Kim files for divorce. Jim is disfellowshipped from the Jehovah's Witnesses. If you're disfellowshipped, there can be a range of consequences, the most severe of which can be this shunning. The church rules Jim should be shunned. When the divorce is finalized in April of 1980, Kim becomes a single woman in a congregation that looks down on her. What happened to her mother is now happening to her. It's her worst nightmare come true. Kim and I, and a number of others of us, were rather on the outside. I felt as if we were being treated as second-class citizens. Kim's friends avoid her. At meetings, people turn the other way. Just one month after she is officially divorced, Kim arranges to attend a church-sponsored retreat in Maui. She is determined to find a husband. There was a place there that catered to Jehovah's Witnesses, I think run by a Jehovah's Witness couple. The morning after she arrives, Kim is introduced to a man from Texas. His name is Jeff Anderson. He was polite, respectful, always kind of clean-cut looking, around six feet tall. Jeff tells her he's living in Hawaii and works locally as a disc jockey. 
And like most people at this resort, the two share one important thing in common. He claimed that he was a faithful witness. They are both smitten. He kept flattering her and sending her flowers and sending her letters and making phone calls. I, I just wanted to ask you a question. Then, in January 1981, Jeff Kim proposes Kim during a nightly phone call, and Kim accepts. Yes. It's a whirlwind romance, but they are ecstatic to start their new life and raise a devout family together in the church. A wedding date is set for August 1981 in Houston, Texas, where Jeff's mother lives. It seems like a dream come true as Kim packs up her children and flies south for the big day. Wedding day arrives, everything begins to go wrong. He's just running late. I'm sure he has a good reason. Right. Jeff arrives late to his own wedding. He doesn't even have the wedding rings. Are you okay? I'm fine. Why would you ask that? Because you're an hour late. I'm here, aren't I? When Kim questions him, he surprises everyone by yelling at her, viciously. Don't make a scene. Oh, okay. People could see that he was less than ideal witness material. My mom always had a radar for abusive men. She believed that that guy was very, very abusive. Without the rings, Kim and Jeff say their vows. Their marriage is off to a rocky start. But Kim is dead set on being a faithful wife and regaining good standing in the church she loves. You need to show me something. Within a week, Jeff reveals the truth. He's been feeding her a steady stream of lies. He's been arrested for petty theft. He's never held a steady job. He isn't a disc jockey living in Hawaii. He's out of work and living in Houston with his mother. Jeff is shocked, and she's even more upset to learn that while Jeff is a baptized Jehovah's Witness, he's not at all the devout follower he said he was during their courtship. I want to go door to door again. Jeff Anderson could pretend to be a faithful witness. No. Because he knew the buzzwords that Jehovah's Witnesses use. But I don't think he was particularly enamored of the religion. I think it was a relationship of convenience, his association with Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm working on that. Baby, I want y'all to be happy with me. Jeff had promised to move his new family back to Canada after the wedding, but he doesn't have enough money. I'm not a liar. Instead, Jeff, Kim, and her two children, Yuri and Lindsay, move into a small apartment outside Houston. This is my house. She was quite frustrated. Jeff was not contributing financially. This is not the life Kim was promised. But as a dutiful witness, she must respect her family's new patriarch. You're right. You're right. Then things go from bad to worse. Jeff rules with an iron fist, criticizing Kim's shopping and housekeeping, demanding to know where she is at all times. And his cold domination of her turns physical. No, please. When Kim declines Jeff's sexual advances, he forces himself on her. To keep Kim in line, Jeff threatens to go to church elders if she resists. Kim knows that in their eyes, and the eyes of Jehovah, she would be seen as in the wrong. There's sort of the unwritten rule that Jehovah's Witness women are to give their due, meaning the sexual due, to their husbands. Women. But only three weeks into the marriage, her daughter Lindsay is on the phone with her father and says something that stops him in his tracks. Mommy and Jeff were fighting and they got hurt. She lets slip that she saw Kim and Jeff have a physical fight that left both of them with blood on their faces. When we talked to Kim about that, she just said, oh no, that was an accident. Uh, we were unpacking some boxes and our heads bumped accidentally. And I believe that. For Kim, going to the police is not an option. And neither is reporting the incident to the church. Besides, the church wouldn't look kindly on a request for a second divorce. Back against the wall, Kim tries to be the best wife she can be. For another month, the family struggles to get by until Kim starts to suspect something that no mother could ignore. Kim was suspicious that uh, Jeff Anderson was molesting at least one of the children. Kim isn't sure of the extent of the abuse, but she has a terrible feeling. There clearly was something very seriously going wrong. I think she knew about it, but just couldn't bring herself to talk about it. Kim doesn't know where to turn. 
All she knows is that she can't stand idly by and allow harm to come to her innocent children. So just six weeks after her wedding, Kim manages to borrow enough money to fly with her children back to Canada. Hoping desperately for understanding, Kim goes straight to her congregation's church elders. He lied. He told me he was a devout witness. She tells them that she was duped by Jeff. Go on. She describes the fights, the violent sex. He forced himself on me. The suspicions of child abuse. Maybe. She asks the elders to support her decision to leave the marriage. This guy was not good for her. She tried to reason with them, engage them, get them to pay more attention to her problems uh, with him. But church elders are not convinced. They say Kim has no solid proof Jeff is doing anything harmful to her children. And perhaps the problem is with her, not Jeff. You have been divorced before. We discussed it. They thought of her as being disloyal or headstrong. Strive to make this marriage work and be a dutiful, faithful wife. Church elders tell Kim she is scripturally obligated to make the marriage work. Kim was beaten down. She was hanging on for dear life to what she wanted her life to be. If Kim defies the elders, she faces disfellowship, being shunned by the church and her family. It's terrifying. Kim grew up as a witness. That's the only thing she knew, and she was convinced that anything else would lead to death for her and her children. Despite her instinct to protect her family from her husband, of course. Kim bows to the elders' authority. You know what's best. She invites Jeff to come join her in Canada. Inwardly, she was wishing that he would go away and leave her alone, but outwardly, she had to show to the elders that she was compliant with the marriage. In September 1982, elders in Kim Anderson's church tell her to reunite with her abusive husband, Jeff and make the marriage work. She believes she has no choice but to follow orders. She had to conform to what the Jehovah's Witness uh, elders expected of her as a married woman. But when Jeff moves to Canada to live with Kim and the kids, it doesn't take long for him to pick up where he left off. Where are my cigarettes? I asked you to get one simple thing for me, one thing for me from the store. Cigarettes, that's it, and you can't do that. You're right, you're right. He can't hold down a job. He is violent and unpredictable. And to her horror, Kim is convinced he has started molesting her daughter, Lindsay, again. He was just twisted, mean, nasty. Most of us cannot imagine such cruelty. She had to somehow go along and make it look like she was going along, but at the same time, she knew she wanted nothing to do now with her second husband. By July of 1984, Kim is living in terror. There's all this fear going on. Fear of Jeff Anderson, fear of the elders, fear of her future. This time, Kim's fear triggers desperate action. She decides to approach the elders once more with a final plea to allow her a divorce. The elders interview Jeff and Kim separately. Kim gives new evidence of Jeff's abuse. Jeff, I'm ready for you. Praying that this time her claims won't fall on deaf ears. She's always been so willful and disobedient. You know, she will make up stories. But when the interviews are over, Kim gets devastating news. Bearing false witness against a member of the fellowship is serious. He had defeated her in the meeting with the witness elders. Not only do the elders reject Kim's request for a divorce, they chastise her for bringing more false charges against Jeff and for not being a dutiful witness wife. She was very upset because the elders were not believing her. They only believed Jeff. The elders punish Kim for insubordination. She is denied the right to evangelize door to door, a devastating penalty for any witness. The witnesses really kept supporting Jeff. The religion helped him out and assisted him in keeping her in line. On the way home, Kim faces the truth. She is completely powerless within the strict confines of her beloved religion. She was caught between a rock and a hard place between the Jehovah's Witnesses' authorities and what was good for her and the children. For the first time ever, 
Kim questions those who claim to speak for Jehovah. The elders are just people and they make mistakes and she could easily see through those faults. For the sake of her children, Kim feels she has no choice but to risk everything she knows and leave her husband as quickly as possible. So on July 21st, 1984, Kim plans an escape. She waited till he came home from work. She waited till he was in the shower. While Jeff is in the bathroom, Kim gathers the children and makes her move. Kim? Kim? She took the car and came to my house. Kim? Jeff didn't know where she was. You planned this from the start, didn't you? Jeff will not tolerate the abandonment. Fuming and seeking vengeance, Hello. he reports her as a runaway wife to the elders. She ran away. Some people can't handle rejection. And their response is, well, I'll get even. The church demands Kim return to her husband, but she resists. Jeff is shocked by her rebellion. He's relied on Kim's devotion to the church to control her, but that's not working anymore. His control, which was essential to him, to have this control, was slipping away. In the fall of 1984, Kim returns to the apartment and Jeff moves out. But he is not about to let go of her. He takes a basement apartment directly across the street and he makes his presence known. He was stalking her, he was watching her. He was sending her notes, probably love notes, made her skin crawl. Basically, if I can't have you, nobody can have you. Jeff calls day and night, demanding reconciliation. With the church supporting his mission to get his wife back, Jeff believes Jehovah is on his side. He was rejected by her, and he couldn't accept that. He was feeling anger, fear, jealousy, revenge, not being able to cope. Things escalate. Jeff begins breaking into her house. He was sabotaging her appliances by disconnecting wires, just dirty tricks to let her know that he was still around and still cause her misery, her power and control. He couldn't take rejection. He kept pursuing her and pursuing her. Since her church doesn't recognize the gravity of her situation, Kim has taken matters into her own hands. She's convinced Jeff to move out and changed her locks, but she's hesitant to ask for help. Kim was very careful with what she said, as if she was afraid of something. And I felt that fear. August 29th is a hot summer day. Yeah. Kim is home on the phone with her mother. Yeah. It's been a good morning so far, and Kim is feeling at ease for the first time in too long. So at ease that she forgot to lock the front door. Jeff walks into Kim's kitchen. He just walked in. Kim was there. The children were in the bedroom. Before Kim can react, we need to talk. She finds herself staring down the barrel of a sawed-off shotgun. Mom, I have to go. There's, there's a gun in my face. Kim saying something about there's a gun pointed at me. I can't talk anymore. Where are they? The bedroom. Kim's mother is still on the other end of the line. Confused and frantic, she calls 911. She said he had a gun. The call immediately sets a police response team in motion. Within ten minutes, a hostage negotiator from the local police calls Kim's apartment. Hello? Kim desperately tries to explain what's going on. She sees Jeff walking towards Yuri and Lindsay. Please hurry. He's in the bedroom. She said, oh my God, he's going into the bedroom with the children. Do what I say! You try to reason with them. If his beef was with his wife, the negotiator would try to at least get the children released. Then work on getting the individual to surrender himself. Please come. Kim manages to lure Jeff away from the kids. It's the police. And onto the phone. They want to talk to you. Hello? You tell him to stay back. Jeff threatens to kill everyone if the police try to intervene. I mean it. You tell them to stay back. You hear me? And then, at 11.16 a.m., the line goes dead. Police have now surrounded the apartment building. 
you can't just rush in. You have to weigh the dangerous end of trying to protect the people that are in the house. You never loved me. You said you loved me, but you never loved me. According to later police records of this event, Don't you look at me! The entire family is in a back bedroom, and Jeff is screaming at Kim, complaining about all the pain he says she's caused him. For an hour, he berated her and tortured her verbally. I can't believe you would do this to me! Why had you rejected me, and why can't we get back together? Kim tries to take the blame for their failed marriage. As your wife, I, I, sh I should have listened to the elders. I should have listened to you. Okay. But when Jeff asks her to hug him, she cannot bring herself to do it. Suddenly, something changes in Jeff. He aims the gun at her, and to the horror of her children, he fires, killing her instantly. Ten-year-old Lindsay is clutching a teddy bear. Jeff points the gun at her. She held her hands up in a defensive motion uh, to the shotgun, and uh, he shot Lindsay. Yuri put his arms around his sister, and he shot him too. In an instant, three lives are brutally and senselessly cut short. Jeff leaves the gun in the apartment and calmly walks out the front door. He is immediately arrested. When police enter the apartment, they find a scene of indescribable horror. There's no words to explain how police feel when children are involved. I said to my investigators, I wished he had just turned the gun on himself. One officer is charged with a heartbreaking task, telling Jim his children have been gunned down. Mr. Kostelnik. An officer in plain clothes came to call. He took a printout from his vest pocket and he read it, but he was shaking so much that the letter was almost falling out of his hands. I thought, uh, I didn't want to hear it, but I had to hear it. For Jim Kostelnik, a man who had long ago questioned the Jehovah's Witness doctrine, the church's response to the murder of his ex-wife and children, chilling. All that was discussed was that Kim, Yuri, and Lindsay were going to get the reward after Armageddon. They would be resurrected on that day and uh, would live happily ever after in Christ's kingdom. Jim attends his children's funeral at Kingdom Hall, hoping to mourn with old friends and family in the witness community. But even on this saddest of days, Jim is shunned, ignored by everyone in the room. It's almost as if we were invisible because I was disfellowshipped, you see. And so they did that in the house of God. They shunned the father of the victims. On December 4th, 1986, a jury finds Jeff Anderson guilty of three counts of first-degree murder. He gets a life sentence for each count. But Jeff Anderson is not finished with Kim and her family. Jeff even consents to TV interviews and remains focused on the twisted idea that he was wronged. She very much seemed apathetic and indifferent. She didn't take me serious even then, a man with a gun. And that was the ultimate rejection. It was the final rejection. I couldn't take any more. I started pulling the trigger, and I couldn't stop. I had to get things out, and this seemed to be the only way. He didn't really seem to be aware of very much beyond himself and his own feelings. This is selfishness, cruelty, self-centeredness. That's what he was about. He was a sociopath. 